Sweden was founded in 1397 under the Union of Kalmar. In 1280, King Magnus Lagerlis issued a statute that organized society on the feudal system. Sweden eventually became a parliamentary republic in 1718 when the Swedish parliament were powerful enough to abolish royal absolutism. In the 20th century, the Swedish people founded popular labor and universal suffrage movements, which led to the creation of the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats entered the Swedish government in 1917, changing Sweden's system of rule to a representative democracy, which is Sweden's current government. In the 17th century, King Gustav II Adolf played a pivotal role in Sweden's military and global recognition. He intervened in the Thirty Years' War, and under his rule, Sweden became a leading military power. During the monarchy period of Sweden, King Gustav Eriksson managed to unify Sweden in the 16th century and fought for an independent Sweden. The current Prime Minister of Sweden is Stefan Löfven, who led Sweden to recognize the state of Palestine in an attempt to reach a solution between Israel and Palestine. Sweden is the first country who has done this after recently gaining membership in the European Union. The documented Swedish law code was called the First Agenda, and what it was was it was uh, a, a runic uh, inscribed ring, and it had it was filled with customary law that had been passed down um, from generation to generation with different um, Swedish families, and that was considered the first um, written down law code. Um, later in the Middle Ages, um, Sweden wasn't necessarily a unified um, government, so Sweden sort of had their own different provincial law codes, so like the Vastagotten law codes would be different from the Uppalen law codes or the Ostrogotland law codes, for instance. Uh, however, they were all kind of similar. Um, they weren't necessarily written, written down. They, they're all kind of over this broad category called the Scanian Laws. And um, what's interesting about this is they would have um, what's called a lagman or a lawgiver, which is similar to an African Jiro or any one of those um, kind of ancient storytellers. And they would kind of use moral stories to talk about the punishments and the crimes uh, of that society. Uh, later on um, in Swedish history, uh, once you get closer to the unification, you have Magnus Eriksson um, creating a 13, in 1350 a law code that uh, was more official. It was written down in Latin, and uh, it was spread kind of across um, the different provinces, and that eventually helped Sweden become a unified body. Um, Sweden eventually became a constitutional monarchy in the 1700s, and that's when they sort of take a modern form of government, but um, it, Sweden has a lot of different ancient law codes that they use throughout their history. The Royal Church of Sweden wasn't organized until 1164, when Sweden became primarily Christian. Christianity played a large role in Sweden's territorial expansion and they launched the first Swedish crusade in order to convert Finns to Christianity. The Protestant Reformation in Sweden took place in the 16th century and was mainly used as a political tool by the king to take control of the church and its assets. Gustavus Adolphus lives on as a hero and legendary general in Sweden. He earned the title of Father of Modern Warfare after using innovative tactics incorporating infantry, cavalry, and mobile artillery. Gustavus made a multitude of advancements in military science, which made Sweden a dominant Baltic power during the 17th century. He was the first general to, general to use mobile artillery and forms of combined arms in his formation. His legacy as a general influenced future commanders such as Napoleon and Karl von Clausewitz, and now has a national, de national holiday dedicated to him in Sweden. One of the unique characteristics about Sweden is their um, claim that they hail w uh, women's rights very highly, that they uh, are one of probably the most equal countries in the world, and uh, that kind of has some of its roots in the ancient law codes that uh, were the provincial law codes of Sweden. Um, in the law code of uh, Västergötland, it talks a lot about the different uh, rights, I guess you could say, or protections that women had. Um, 
uh, I guess a woman, a woman, her first duty, according to this law code, was that um, she would uh, be in charge of domestic duties and household activities, and they uh, called this uh, idea sort of Schultzro um, Rusten, um, and that uh, basically meant the right to key. So they had a little bit of authority inside of the house, but kind of outside the house, they didn't do much really. Um, it also talks about, I guess, how um, women were protected against rape. If a woman was raped or uh, in the process of being raped, she was uh, legally allowed to kill the assaulter and uh, kill him, and she would not be punished for it. Um, that's a very big step, I guess, in uh, women's rights, especially during the Middle Ages when these law codes were around. Uh, in general, women, they uh, had... The husband had to pay a dowry in order to get them. Uh, as for marriage laws, a lot of the Vastergotland and the Upland law codes talk about marriage laws. Um, and these sorts of things just continued on until um, you get to the modern form of Swedish government. Um, nowadays in Sweden, um, uh, the women's rights record is actually very good. So 45% of Sweden's parliament, the Riksdag, is comprised of women, which is the highest percentage in the world. And 80% of women are employed in the workforce, and that's also extremely high, although um, a lot of those are uh, half-time workers. They're not necessarily fully employed, but still that's very high. Um, also, Sweden has free universal child care, and that helps women um, uh, allow them to go pursue their careers instead of being tied down to the household. Sweden has um, very much been an active member in trying to create world peace. Um, even in World War, in both of the World Wars, actually, they remained neutral, and since then they've kind of been one of those countries that um, are typically at the negotiating table trying to broker a deal for between two countries at war. Um, so they're definitely involved with a lot of that in terms of their uh, world, in the world stage. Uh, and one of the major conferences that the, uh, Sweden kind of hosts and they actually founded was the Sami Convention. And that was founded in 1953 and it's a gathering between Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Russia. And its goal is to kind of outline the rights of the indigenous Sami people who live in those four countries um, and they're indigenous to Scandinavia. So. For instance, recently they uh, allowed for the Sami people to uh, herd reindeer since they're nomadic reindeer herders by trade, and uh, since reindeer herding is typically illegal uh, in all those countries. So um, the Sami people kind of get their own certain rights, and Sweden does a big part in trying to um, make sure that they obtain their, uh, maintain their sovereignty and their rights. Sweden invented the Ombudsman, a state official appointed to provide a check on government activity and to investigate illegal government activity at the request of the citizens. The Ombudsman is very similar to the U.S. system of checks and balances, except that the Ombudsman can be more versatile. Ombudsman example, examine complaints from outside the offending state in order to avoid bias. The Ombudsman can address many current governmental issues in the U.S., such as invasion of privacy with the Patriot Act and drones, and I believe that the Ombudsman could be a very powerful asset to the people of the U.S. in effectively addressing societal issues with our government and could, could potentially be the new approach that the citizens of the U.S. need. Well, sitting with me is the public protector of Sweden, and I need to get a couple of things clear. And uh, Elizabeth Fura Christina, welcome to South Africa in the first place. Thank you. And so thank much. you for giving us a little bit of time as well. I see that you're actually described as Chief Parliamentary Ombudsman. Yes. And uh, that is one of the famous Swedish inventions. 205 years ago, uh, the Ombudsman was actually um, invented, or the position. Absolutely. Of the, tell us a little bit about the past. Well, briefly, it was the king who wanted to have some order in his house while he was away, out making war, basically. So he, he appointed someone to represent him uh, and to keep the civil servants doing their job, according to the rules. 
So the Ombudsman now looked at as one of the institutions sort of a key to a democratic society it was actually invented and created in a society that was not democratic at all. So, so where does the public protector fit in? Or is that just another name? For I would say it's another name. You see, after, uh, afterwards, the, this, this uh, institution, uh, the Ombudsman Institution, spread around the world. And I think now there is something like uh, 140 Ombudsman institutions around the world in all different parts. Mm -hmm. But we all are, are uh, different. There are, uh, there are regional ombudsmen and there are um, sort of national ombudsmen. And some ombudsmen are reporting uh, to the government, to the executive, while the classical ombudsman, uh, like the Swedish ombudsman, is a parliamentary ombudsman, which means that we are uh, elected by parliament and we report to parliament. But we don't take instructions from parliament neither the parliament nor the government. We are independent, so we uh, operate within the framework uh, set out in our constitution and in the law, uh, ruling or legislating the, the Ombudsman institution. So there's only one Zlatan. <laughs>